Okay, welcome everyone to the sixth uh, editorial talk of Orinoco Tribune, the seconds of this year, and it will be on whatever is happening in Peru at the moment. Uh, so since uh, December 7th of last year, when the far right forces of Peru ultimately managed to oust the democratically elected president, Pedro Castillo, after 16 months of continuous harassment and the stabilization attempts, the Peruvian people have taken to the streets to express their collective outrage against the coup. And like in any US endorsed democracy, uh, they have been met with a repressive violence by the de facto government of Dina Boluarte, killing more than 76 people until the end of January. Meanwhile, uh, the current more or less silence, let's say, of the organizations such as UNASUR and CELAC has not gone unnoticed by those of us who saw these international bodies toil to address regional crisis during the times when Chavez, Fidel, Lula, and the Kirchners were in power. Well, Lula is in power again, but CELAC and UNASUR no longer seem the same. Against the backdrop of a clear parliamentary coup, Castillo made the decision to dissolve the Congress following Article 134 of the Peruvian Constitution. However, the fact that this outcome was facilitated by a series of uh, mistakes that Castillo committed during his uh, short presidential period is undeniable. Everyone on the left must address those mistakes in order to avoid a repetition of this or a similar crisis in Peru or elsewhere, anywhere in the world. So this situation in Peru also emphatically underscores the importance of having a clear path towards uh, having constituent processes in Latin America and in other parts of the global south. All progressive forces need to evaluate their goals and priorities while taking into consideration socialist revolutions that have been uh, successful and have been able to maintain power, like in Venezuela. It is important to conceptualize this process for uh, bulletproofing constitutional amendments aimed at building a socialist and anti-imperialist project, thus strengthening the new multipolar order. And I mention constituent assembly because uh, that has been a uh, demand of the Peruvian people for a very long time, even before Castillo. So to discuss all these things, we have with us today, Clau O'Brien Moscoso, who is an organizer with the Black Alliance for Peace in the Haiti Americas team. She is originally from Barrios Altos of Lima, but she grew up in New Jersey and now lives between New York and Lima. So, Clau, thanks a lot for accepting this invitation and being here with us today to discuss. Thank you for having me, folks. Pleasure to be here. Hi, uh, Clau. My name is Jesus Rodriguez. Uh, uh, if you don't know me, I'm the editor of Orinoco Tribune. I'm based in Caracas. And this is a pleasure to have Clau today with us. Uh, and uh, I basically want to let you know that we, what we're going to do right now is to have a, a conversation as we always try to have with Clau. And we will try uh, after you know she answers three questions that we already prepared. Uh, uh, we will try to jump in to make some comments or remarks or you know anything that we consider relevant to enrich the the, the conversation, the discussion. Uh, and after that, uh, we are going to have like a, we're going to try to bring questions from the audience. So I encourage anyone uh, watching us on YouTube first to subscribe to our channel because we are trying to 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 improve our our you know our presence in YouTube. Um, but also to ask questions and to participate in the chat uh, in order to bring those questions, the most relevant ones, at the end of the conversation. So without further ado, I will jump to the first question, Clau, uh, and, and that question is basically this one. What is really happening in the street of Peru right now? How is the uprising being coordinated, if it really is? What are the foreseeable moves by the far-right forces to smash you know, the uprising. I mean, that that, that is basically uh, what we want to learn in this move, first movement of our conversation. So go ahead. Yeah, so um, again, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I, um, I came here, I came back home uh, January 3rd, the day before the um, 
national strike started, uh, specifically to visit family, but also to be, you know, on the ground organizing for people who haven't really been among in three decades almost. But um, so in the two months that I've been here and really organizing, I'm sorry, one month that I've been here and really organizing, um, it's just, it's very clear that it's a lot of the, the masses that are coming in from southern regions or, or other provincial regions who have really faced the brunt of the violence since this uh, parliamentary coup took place two months ago. Um, and one day alone, Juliaca Puno suffered uh, 17 deaths and then two more confirmed deaths from uh, injuries uh, that from that same day. I believe that was January 9th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so a lot of the people that are coming in from southern regions or, or outer regions are, 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 you know, families of the massacred, literally everyone in community. Um, and the reason that they come to Lima is because capital, the, the capital city is here, but every type of imaginable power is concentrated here um, without really having any production value. Like, Lima doesn't have water, Lima doesn't have electricity, we, we, we can't grow food. Um, so everything comes from the southern regions where there's all these riches, resources, right? Um, but those communities, those predominantly indigenous um, campesino communities um, barely have access to education, to healthcare, the roads, there is no paved roads, very little, any, just a real lack of infrastructure, right? Which is really what motivated so many people on um, to to vote for Castillo, right? Because this is the first president that they see uh, looks like them, comes from similar backgrounds as them, and is talking about what has has plagued us for so long, right? Is talking about the need for a constituent assembly, the need for um, addressing and changing the dictatorship era. Fujimori um, constitution uh, for a more popular and plurinational constitution um, that would in, that would ensure that you know a, a region a, a country that has so many resources actually benefits from those resources right instead of because the constitution the ninety three Fujimori constitution by law privatizes um, all of our all of our resources uh, and and sectors and everything so it's it's very much, even though the dictatorship officially ended in 2000, we, we are still in the midst of it, right? We're, we're still in a post, if you want to call it that, quasi, but still very much the same legalities and everything that, um, you know, it was really co coming from Washington at the time and continues to, to prefer U.S. and Western-backed companies and, and the local uh, oligarchy along with the the very like fascist, hard right political parties that still uh, dominate in Lima, um, and so you know most of these folks that are coming up have and and continue to come up. But this week we're expecting more delegations coming up from Ayacucho, Arequipa, uh, the ninth, the um, on February 9th, uh, So in two, on Thursday is going to be the um, national strike that was called for by the um, General Confederation of Workers, uh, which is the first time that they've called for a strike in about 20 years, uh, I think a little bit over 20 years. Um, so even though the struggle and the and the battle has really been taking place in Lima in terms of the different forces on the ground here, the the violence has really been happening on on the ground in the southern provinces and, and the outer regions, right? Although Last Saturday, the January 28th, was the first registered death in Lima. Um, a compañero from Huancabelica, uh, southern province, um, uh, Victor Santi Esteban Yaxilvalca. Um, he was a union leader. Uh, I believe he was 56 years old. Uh, we, we still have a comrade, um, one of our friend's cousins, who is still in a coma for, after suffering a brutal head injury that day, that night. Uh, I, I think that night was probably the, the most violent night we had experienced in Lima thus far um, with tanks, um, just incessant um, 
tear gas throwing and, and the, their orders are shoot to kill. We've seen from the first day that I got here, um, they're, and not just in, in the Southern regions, like I said, they're getting the brunt of it, but in Lima too, uh, we've seen that they are just shooting directly at the head or torso, uh, that they're specifically targeting press. Uh, the medics brigade last week, that same night, the, the night of the first death here, um, multiple of us in, in, in the independent press were, were um, like I was thrown to the ground. Uh, I, I had to take the week off just to recover because I couldn't, I couldn't walk. Um, multiple, the, when we went to, that's again, that same night when we went to do the vigil at the, at the hospital, um, all the family members were, were corralled and beaten by the cops right at the door of the hospital, Hospital Grau. Um, and we just see that it's, it's, a, it's the same dictatorship, uh, the same brutality we have not seen in about, you know, 30, almost 30 years, right? Uh, 20 years since, uh, 23 years since the end of the Fujimori dictatorship. But the organs of power are still very much in the same hands, right? It, it's the president of Congress, um, William Zapata, Tarola, uh, I'm sorry, William uh, Zapata, Jose William Zapata was, um, is considered the butcher of the, the Andes. Uh, um, this was back in the, I believe, 90s, no, maybe early 2000s, was a massacre of 65, at least, I'm sorry, at least 69 people that he's directly responsible for who's never faced any justice. So we see that this is actually still the same continuation. So even though on paper things changed, the political rea reality on the ground is that, you know, this is a continuation of the Monroe Doctrine, this is a continuation of the U.S. back dictatorship. Um, you know, we're, we're understanding on the ground that this is a, you know, 200 plus years long struggle. I mean, we're not going to win it right away, but we are absolutely in it for the long haul. Listen, listen, uh, Clau, and can you tell us a little bit of, uh, you know, what forces are capitalizing and, you know, this uprising, the, the, the public discontent, the outrage uh, that have, you know, awakened since December 7. I mean, are there progressive forces? Are there, I mean, uh, can you explain us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, there have been uh, union delegations that are coming from the, uh, from the provinces, but mostly it's the provinces themselves that are self-organizing that know their union leaders or their, um, you know, social movement leaders that, that know uh, which cultural association they be belong to and have literally been organizing with them for decades, if not their whole lives. Here in Lima, we've seen a, very much a proliferation of self-forming formations, uh, organizations, just group of comrades that have been there since the first day that are organizing solidarity, you know, uh, fundraising, getting people uh, housing, food, making sure there's enough for transportation. Um, and even though at every turn, it seems that, you know, we, we get thwarted by the police. There's, we absolutely see a huge proliferation and in infiltration tactics. Uh, there's been hundreds, if not more, of uh, retired police and military that have come back to basically be involved, to be undercover cops that end up, you know, being the first ones that incite violence. And then the entire protest gets blamed for the burning of a of a building in by near Plaza San Martin, which myself included, but so many people on the ground have footage that it was the, the police, the national police that were firing tear gas canisters directly at this building's uh, roof, knowing it would catch on fire because they did the same thing in 2000 with the Banco Nacional, right? During the Fujimori dictatorship, Monte, Fujimori slash Montesinos dictatorship. Um, they're using the same tactics as in, uh, state terrorism. Um, but again, I think because people that have been on the ground, you know, and, and every day we're getting hundreds, if not thousands of delegations coming up. So there is increasingly a critical mass, even though the repression has been so unlike anything we've seen really in our lifetime, in my lifetime, since I was a kid, really. Um, 
that there's there's I mean they say that there's only been a handful of deaths in Lima. We 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 believe that's a severe undercount, uh, even from the first day of the strike on the fourth. Um, we believe that there's been the the undercount overall, not just in Lima, but throughout the country is, is it's not, it's a severe undercount. Um, the disappeared also, um, and the severely injured that are, that, that are still in the hospital, um, all these numbers are being downplayed for sure. Uh, and the amount of violence that we've seen, uh, including sexual violence, particularly with the students, um, at the that were that were brutally evicted with military tanks at uh, Universidad de San Marcos, um, who, that has a history, right? And and not just from uh, this past dictatorship, but but previous, right? Latin America has a history of our autonomous universities lending themselves to mass movements on the ground. So the day that we we here in Lima, we knew that people were coming up. Students had already organized themselves to take control and occupy their universities, not just San Marcos, but Uni, the uh, Universidad Nacional de Ingeniería, the engineering school. All these schools have long history of doing, of being in struggle with, with our indigenous campesino comrades. Um, listen, listen, Cloud. Uh, and, and is there a risk of uh, uh, the movement being co-opted I mean, I, I'm, ask, I, I'm asking the question because uh, I mean, the first thing that come to my, comes to my mind when I talk about that is Chile and Boric. Uh -huh. and, yep. and, and, you know, I mean, the, usually in this kind of, you know, events, uh, there the are people trying to capitalize, even right wingers, but sometimes are the yes. just liberal centrists that wants to, you know, capitalize the discontents in order to, do you see that as a risk there? I mean, is there, and also there, is there a risk of, you know, uh, the, the, the movement being dispersed or disintegrated by this? I, I believe that there's definitely, I mean, there's always a risk of the, the oligarch is not going to just, okay, we're done. Um, there's yes. always going to be a pushback, you know, um, there's, there's, it's not just the local oligarchy, right? It's, I, I mean, I listen to, when, when the enemy speaks, I, I listen, right? And I remember Laura Richardson, the general commander of Southcom saying, salivating at the mouth, how rich in resources our areas are, right? Um, and just recently, I think maybe it was last year, um, there was a, a like a lithium mine that were in Puno specifically again I re and I relate this to the amount of violence that Puno has seen is directly correlated to the lithium deposits that that area holds all the resources that that area holds right because it's so close to the lithium triangle which is considered Bolivia Argentina Chile right um, it's it's in that region um, and that mine I believe is expected to be one of the world's largest um, so, you know, I listen when the enemy talks and, and they they are absolutely behind this. Lisa Kenna, the U.S. ambassador who, you know, former CIA um, under Pompeo and, and maintained ambassador under Biden because, you know, the empire has just a continuation. There's no it's two wings of the same ruling party. Um, but. Yeah, we, we know that the risks are there. We, we've seen and although. We, need, we do need to get more uh, actual evidence, but there's definitely uh, a lot of concerns um, and possibilities that, that we've actually seen U.S. military embedded in with the armed forces here. We, we know that there's at least 10, uh, maybe even more, 13 military bases, U.S. military bases in Peru. Uh, so, you know, I believe just yesterday, a, uh, a union leader, um, beloved union leader in Buda in the north coast uh, was assassinated likely by the, the mining company that he had been organizing against for, for decades. Um, so we know we know who's behind this, right? Um, and I think Desaparecidos. because of that, Desaparecidos. Uh -huh. Do you uh, have I know that? He... Because in Colombia, it was like a big deal, uh, you know, during the protests against Duque a few years ago. So is that yeah. happening? Because I've been trying That's to... That's absolutely oh. happening. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you have yeah, a number? Yeah, we, we've no. gotten... We don't have a number. We believe it's at least in the hundreds, maybe maybe in the thousands already. But we've, we've gotten videos of... Um, 
comrades in helicopters uh, dressed as military, um, you know, hearkening back to, you know, Operation Condor days and, and still. Uh, so, so there's definitely, like I said before, I think the numbers of deaths disappeared, even injured, are, are severe undercount. Um, yes, yes. I've been trying to, yeah. to follow the numbers of, you know, dis desaparecidos. Uh -huh. And it's not hard to find. It's not. I believe that no one is paying attention to that. So I. I that's what not, I want no. to. Or maybe it's not happening, but I doubt it. It is absolutely happening. It is absolutely happening. Yeah, yeah. No, and 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 every day, as much as you know, whenever we get uh, updates of someone is missing, you know, we we. That's one thing that we right away we start sharing. Um, we've gotten a few people been able to come back um, into our hands, but. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely also disappearing people. Listen, Compass from the Orinoco Tribune team, do you want to ask something? Do you want to add something to the to the to to this part of the of the comment, or should I jump to the second question? Second question. Okay, okay. Uh, the second question is this, Claude. Uh, what do you see in regional? and international bodies should do to avoid more human rights violations, more uh, to avoid what is happening basically in Peru. And I'm asking you this because uh, UNASUR, CELAC, a few years ago uh, during the time of Chavez, the Kirchner, uh, mm -hmm. Correa, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, that was the, a great forum to solve where, where presidents in the region solved this kind of issues. But yeah. after that first wave of, you know, progressive socialist presidents in the region, the right wing governments that came uh, afterwards, yeah. and, uh, you know, they, they worked very hard to dismantle those organizations. And right yeah. now we see CELAC, you know, trying to revive uh, you don't see too much about UNASUR. I believe it's going to be harder uh, after all the damage that they did uh, to reverse, you know, to make it, uh, you know, be alive again. But I'm asking you that uh, in relation to, you know, those great regional forums that were created during the first progressive wave in the region, but also to contrast it with OIS. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 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 I mean, o OAS, basically what it does is the contrary. I mean, it basically promotes U.S. agenda, the stabilization and, and that kind of uh, things. So I just wanted to ask you about that. And I, and I, I, and I just want to add that I was checking the Buenos Aires declaration, the declaration mm -hmm. that was signed uh, after the the last CELAC summit that a lot of people in the region, especially progressive forces, has been uh, happy because that um, even happened. But but when reading the Buenos Aires Declaration, the final statement of the summit, uh, there's nothing, zero, about Peru. Nothing. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that because that surprised me a lot. This regarding that during yeah. the summit, uh, some presidents like Xiomara Castro uh, 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 did, um, you know, uh, make amazing statements, uh, you know, criticizing mm -hmm. the coup and everything. But, but what can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, in regards to some of the individual, um, the responses from our from our uh, regional neighbors, uh, like Bolivia, like Mexico, right? Amlo providing. Um, amnesty or political amnesty for um, for Castillo's immediate family, um, like you said, Simona Castro, uh, even even Bonici's um, statement at CELAC, at the summit, um, we welcome those statements, right? And But specifically um, in the statements and solidarity that we've seen coming from social movements and, and union leadership and indigenous leadership throughout the region. Um, and, but, so while, while, especially as Black Alliance for Peace, while we can welcome some of these statements coming out of CELAC, we also look at the apparent support for the US-UN core group occupation of Haiti in inviting unelected Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry, right? So, so we see the 
absolute contradictions of what this, you know, the difference of what this uh, organ, you know, body was supposed to be from the black first wave. Al- of, by, the way, said, by the way, Black Alliance for Peace make a nice sp- statement about that particular issue that that, that we yes. republish in Orino Contribution because oh, we great, share it great. because we share uh, you know that position sorry yes interrupt, absolutely interrupting you Go no ahead. no thank you yeah no i mean latin american uh publications and just everyone in the region should be up in arms about the betrayal of the haitian revolution continued betrayal constantly right and and i i also loop in lula with this right he was one of the uh leading members of the uh, 2004 uh, coup against um, the, you know, our seats. So, and even now too, right? AMLO is now following in those footsteps is leading the current invasion. So we, especially with the analysis of Black Lines for Peace, the Haiti Americas team, we, we see that these contradictions are, are a betrayal of, of what some of these intended purposes was, but particularly of, of the popular will of people on the ground of our regions, you know? Um, we also question why a Brazilian weapons manufacturing company, Condor, is, is one of the main or, um, companies that's providing the Boluarte regime with uh, tear gas grenades, all sorts of weapons to brutalize our, and repress our people. And Guillermo Lasso's, um, government in Ecuador has also been sending uh, arms here, which is not really surprising because uh, during the outri- the uprisings there, uh, the Peruvian government had been sending them um, weapons to repress the, the population. So the, so we see that the right wing in the region also is very, you know, international and practices solidarity when it comes to their right wing, you know, lawfare campaigns and, and just outright violent campaigns. Um, and, and I mean, for, for, for those of us that I think that think more just outside of one particular country and in the region, I think that there's something that we also need to be better at coordinating our own defense against the brutality of the right wing, the co-optation that will come from whatever liberal or even, you know, far right fascist forces. Um, because we're all, you know, we're. It, we're still uh, this year in December will be the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. And we're still alive and well, right, um, in our regions. And and so I think, yeah, that's. I think that um, particularly the movements in the ground, people, the the organic forces in the ground are the ones that need to be organizing and coordinating and and sharing notes, really. Listen, uh, but. but... But talking about the general public, I mean, the people on the streets in Lima or in the south of Peru, do you feel that, that like they are missing CELAC or UNASUR or they don't even know about that? Because that's that's part of the problem also. Uh, and and uh, or, or do you feel that they hate uh, the OAS? And they oh, are absolutely. aware of. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So even so. You know, we'll t- we talking about some of these like supposedly progressive forces that seem to not actually be you know following the political trajectory intended. You see the the forces that are just openly you know U.S. Western imperialist uh, apologists for them, um, the local elites, whatever. There, are other. Th- the OAS has declared its unconditional support. The U.S. has, uh, you know, declared its unconditional support for the Boluarte regime, both militarily and financially. Um, Lisa Kenna, the U.S. ambassador, has been feverishly meeting um, with our internal elites, um, the armed forces here, the car politicians, but also the transnational uh, corporations. Um, I forget which minister it was that uh, a couple of weeks ago was in, was in Davos. Um, likely trying to sell off resources to higher bid the high some of the highest bidders right um so we yeah we we definitely see that you know a lot of the forces not internally um have just have betrayed not, it, and it's really i mean it is about you know the elected president our democratically elected pre- president castillo it's really about the betrayal of the popular will of the masses who overwhelmingly voted for castillo even if lima itself which is the hotbed for, you know, the liberal fascist elites, 
Um, even if Lima was a much more contested battle, and here is really where the you know contradictions lie, and where really why people are coming up to Lima to you know uh, come come to where the people and and Bolarda herself saying Puno is not Peru, right? That's outrageous to say. I think at the day after she made that statement, more people were coming up from Puno. Um, Right. And, and and also a lot of the provinces in the south have have also said, OK, you don't want to step down. We'll federate. We're, we're out. We're, yeah, we're not Peru. You're right. Yes, and, and, and also saying, like, how are you guys going to live without our resources? Listen, because Lima, like, like I said, go sorry, ahead, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, like I said before, Lima, Lima doesn't produce anything. So it it you know, gets cut off from the water from the Andes, gets cut off from the electricity or the food. From the, it's, it's a wrap. Lima Falls. Listen, listen, I, I want to bring some questions from the audience in YouTube. The first one is, I mean, so there, there's people asking about uh, where, I mean, what are some ways uh, we can help people on the ground in Peru materially? That's one question. Yeah. Um, you can head to my Twitter. I have a, I, I'm personally collecting donations, um, but also I, I share other people's, um, you know, fundraising drives, uh, people that are, you know, vetted for and everything. Um, but, but a lot of, a, a good, lot of the donations. A good organization that, that you think people can donate to? Well, yeah, so, um, it's interesting right now because as I said, we are dealing with a lot of infiltration that it seems like some of the larger organizations or political parties that the that campesinos and indigenous campesinos that are coming from provinces are just kind of like, even from their own uh, union leaders, there's been some internal contradictions that they're battling it out. So um, yeah, it's a little hard to say right now necessarily. Uh, I would say um, Coordinadora N, uh, 14N, which was uh, one of the self-forming um, autonomous groups that came out of the last, well, one of the last battles um, in 2020 when Inti and Brian, Brian were killed for, uh, during the Marino dictatorship um, or, you know, uh, transitory governments. Um, so, so those folks have been on the ground for, for since 20, Waka. 2018. Waka, Waka, Waka also Waka. does, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, they also do great work, um, like on the ground journalism. Um, but they've also been providing some stuff. Um, there's uh, an organization called uh, it's a cultural association called um, Agora Popular um, that has been doing a lot of political education, um, mostly based in San Martin. Uh, the political party Nuevo Peru, Nuevo Peru has um, I've seen them every day out there also collecting donations and trying to coordinate housing for people. Listen, um, listen, listen, sorry for interrupting you. Now, now that you no, mentioned uh, Peru Libre, uh, uh, is it their unity within the party? I mean, because we know that, uh, that the whole scene is a mess inside Peru Libre. So, so yeah. uh, how it is working, how it's... There's is, different, there's uh, essentially what I would say like three different camps within Peru Libre, which are the, you know, people that had already been there prior to Castillo and Boluarte joining to, to run the campaign, uh, the Castillo camp and then the Boluarte camp, um, all of which, I mean, the Boluarte camp at this point has just left because they, uh, she's a traitor. Um, but there's still, there's still, yeah, there's still some, um, you know, contradictions in there too. Um, many people on the ground are just upset at any of the Congress members that are still in power because one of our main demands is the in complete closure of Congress, uh, including the, you know, what many say here are the traitors, traitorous politicians in Peru Libre. Uh, not everyone, but some definitely. Um, so I think here right now, I, I've, I've witnessed the past few weeks has been some of the most intense psychological warfare. Um, like I said, like almost every group has been infiltrated. Um, and, and so now that everyone is sort of having to like step back, regroup, recalibrate security measures, try to move forward. Um, 
but it's a long it's a long battle you know um, so li listen so, so going back to the question yeah. basically the, the the best option uh might be like uh sending also donations direct to people on the ground like you yeah. and others it will be nice to, yeah. to share that information out there too, absolutely you know, because absolutely. I, I, there should be a lot of people wondering how to help or help and especially in, uh, directly uh, to families like to, donating directly to the families. Um, so in, in Peru, it's usually through like uh, YAPE, but from international donations, um, we would have to, you know, I think people still have to like try to set up international accounts or like PayPal accounts, yes. or whatever. But um, if you're within Peru or even within Latin America, you could donate um, directly to those, to the family members. Um, and grassroots organizations, that was probably the best like, 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 yeah. like, like those that you mentioned. There's another yeah, question. Some of those organizations, sure. Listen, there, there's another question that says, what has been the European Union and the left in Spain response to the coup? And 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 what has been Fujimori's role in this coup? Oh That's yeah. I mean question. Yeah. Um so start the first question, right? The US or the left or European. Uh, role in this um it's you know there I think that there was a um there well there has been a lot of solidarity marches that I've seen um Washington I believe maybe this past week or the week before mm -hmm. um there's been there have been a few in Spain and Los Angeles um throughout throughout uh, um even even other countries in Bolivia uh in La Paz there was um there's a protest and I think especially our um you know brothers and sisters in Bolivia that that also went through a coup in 2019 and and saw massacre there as well deeply understand the pain of what's what's happening here and and can you know relate to not just emotionally sentimentally but politically of why the reasons that that coup happened are very much aligned with what's happening now a lot of the same actors you know like I said the the US Southcom Um, they, they make it pretty known um, what, you know, what hegemon, the world hegemon is trying to do in our regions. Great. Um, and, uh, then, and Fujimori part? Fujimori's really? role in it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the daughter, uh, the son, Keiko Fujimori, Kenji Fujimori, they're, they're, they're behind it, right? Uh, Keiko's actually trying to leave to Spain, I forget what the reason was, but we we know that the rats are going to try leaving when they see the ship sinking because they're not trying to face criminal charges, um, right? And then and one of the main laws that they're trying, or one of the main things that they're trying to pass through, I mean, even from the start of the Castillo presidency was the, um, to free uh, Alberto Fujimori, who's um, serving, still serving 25 years uh, for crimes against humanity in the case of La Cantuta and Barrios Altos, Um, although there's many other crimes against humanities that he was never even tried for, um, and that other people and actors um, were not tried for, and that are right now part of the current coup regime. Um, yeah, so the, the the far right here, the the you know imperialist forces are definitely alive and well here. Now that you mentioned the artist, that reminds me about a lot of comments that one can read on YouTube about. You know how fast these right wing, you know, stars from the, you know, um, show business uh, uh, mm -hmm. react to 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 smaller events happening in Cuba or Venezuela or Nicaragua, and mm -hmm. how slow they are in you know organizing eight concerts for. You know, yeah. like they want. Yeah, to. we don't see any SOS Peru concerts. Um, I wonder why. Um, yes. <laughs> can't imagine. <laughs> That's true. Anyone, someone, does anyone from the from the team want to say something in this part? Sahi? Yeah, I have, actually, I have something to ask you, Claude, that uh, there have been teams from the UN and I also believe from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights Yeah. who went to Peru in order to document human rights violations in January. So I guess they sub submitted reports to the 
to the ombudsperson's office or something or their own offices also. So what happened to this report? Like, what did they say there? And what is the condition of those reports at this moment? Anything happened? Yeah, no, of course not. Because um, as our, you know, Nicaraguan comrade Daniel Ortega said recently, these are entities controlled by the West. Um, so why would they? You know, even though there's dictates, right? So yes, the UN and American Commission on Human Rights came to the report. They said they were going to come on a specific day and then didn't come for the, until the following week. Uh, you know, so yeah, people on the ground already know that the, you know these are trade arts organizations. We don't we don't actually believe that. You know, they genuinely care about human rights, or at least people centered human rights. Um, you know, they're more concerned with like freedom for transnational corporations to continue. Stealing our resources. Okay. Uh, right. And there is actually a related question, as Kelly says, from Red Horizon, who asks, well, I think uh, you have already touched upon the subject that has solidarity from other leftist leaders in Latin America helped? And do Peruvian people want to see them do more? So this is the part on which I would like you to focus, the second part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely people on the ground, you know, very much welcome uh, many of the leftist leaders' um, comments, right? Maduro's comments, uh, Miguel Diaz Canel, uh, Daniel Ortega, all these comments uh, from multiple people, right? Um, and, um, and, and including um, Lucho, uh, Luis Arce, and Evo Morales, who is uh, right now barred from entering Peru uh, because. Much as um, in the West, they say, you know, if you say something against uh, U.S. empire, you're immediately a Putin puppet. Here, it seems like you're an Evo puppet or you're financed by illegal mining interests. It couldn't, couldn't be that, you know, these regions are being massacred and people are rightfully coming out in indignation uh, and clamoring for, for justice and, and, and for accountability, right? Um, I, don't, I don't think that these... Uh, the, the surprising is going to let up until we actually see people in jail and actually paying for for the blood of our comrades. That's good. That's good. Um, thank you for your answers, um, Lau. I want to jump to the third part of the of the of the conversation, and it's basically uh, connected to the, these questions. What do you think, Pedro Castillo, should have done to avoid the current situation? And there's another question uh, that I believe is important, and that is, uh, what are the expectations of Peruvians in terms of a constituent assembly? And I'm asking you this not because I want to, uh, I want to, you know, make a, a poner el dedo en la llaga and do like destructive criticism against Castillo, oh, but yeah. just thinking about, you know, learning from mistakes and uh, about yeah. the repetition, that kind of approach is the one that we are looking for. Absolutely. And, and also, uh, when I ask you about the Constituent Assembly, I ask you because at the beginning of this crisis, uh, we, in Orinoco Tribune, we published uh, a piece by a Venezuelan journalist, Clodovaldo Hernández. And he basically mm -hmm. said that why uh, Venezuela is standing up uh, and all other, these other countries uh, fall. So-called yeah. leftist. Con so, so he was somehow critic of Castillo, but also yeah. trying to, but, 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 he, but, but he also tried to uh, raise the importance of the constituent process in Venezuela to bulletproof mm -hmm. yeah. the changes that were promoted by Chavez. But we're, a few days after we published that, there was a, this guy from, from Peru, actually, I believe, an influencer. He had a, a lot of followers in Twitter. Uh, and, and, and he said that he is Chavista supporter. I don't remember his name. Uh, but, uh, but he wrote something uh, 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 in our Twitter account saying that Hugo Chavez had it easy because, because he had the support of the military. And that's absolutely yeah. not, not true, especially at the beginning when the constituent process right. uh, began in Venezuela. So we are thinking in doing something, uh, an important event about this constituent be process, because I believe a lot of people should learn more, yeah. not because they, they are constituent, 
the doing process was perfect or something like that, and it needs to be copied, but just to learn the difficulties that Venezuela had to pass in order to reach the constituent moment, and also the difficulties we had during the constituent moment itself, you know, writing the constitution, mm -hmm. and also the mistakes that, that those constituents did that were tried to be, I mean, that Chavez tried to correct in a, in a in a constitutional uh, reform that he submitted for a referendum that did not win, but but you know, I mean, I I want to to highlight that, but anyway, that debate yeah. on Twitter among us and that guy from Peru uh, make me think that we need to see with more clarity what are the expectations of the people. Uh, about this constituent process. So feel free to say, uh, you know, to answer the questions and we'll jump. Yeah. The yeah. For, uh, yeah, I think that's an absolutely great idea. And I would suggest um, if possible doing it in Spanish because 100% people here want to, want to listen to the experiences of our other comrades throughout La Patria Grande because we know that's also the ultimate goal, right, is is like multipolar and regional cooperation against, you know, the continuation of the Monroe Doctrine from the from our you know northern neighbors. Um, we want, we want so to raise I, the guys from the Alliance for Global Justice and the yeah. guys from uh, Far this Time in Canada, Alison Bodin in Vancouver, uh, in order to create like a, to organize this webinar. I believe that, that this needs to be, that'd be fascinating. So maybe yeah, we will yeah, yeah. have, I'm sure that we will have translation now. I'm, I'm just thinking about the translation scene that you mentioned. Sorry for interrupting yeah. you. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's good, it's good to organize. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, we need to hear from the experiences of our, you know, neighbors. Um, it's important for us too, to learn even, um, like you said, right before the, the co-optation coming from, uh, from Chile, someone like Boric in Chile, right? And and so seeing those mistakes, I mean, that's you had many mistakes, right? Um, I would say definitely that what he needed to have done was organize forces on the ground um, prior to the attempt to dissolve Congress, um, rather than believing that the officials that said they were gonna have his back would have his back because they had already been paid pri days prior, right? Um, I think it was like two or three days prior to the, uh, the parliamentary coup, Lisa Kenna had met with the uh, Minister of Defense, um, like to likely to you know hand him giant you know suitcase filled with uh, U.S. dollars and and to say you know tell him you're going to be behind him and then flip when when he attempts to do you know attempts to dissolve Congress, um, which is what happened, right? Um, but what a lot of people don't say is that um, he had. Under the 93 Constitution, the dictatorship constitution, it actually does allow for the president to dissolve Congress, especially a Congress that was only at a 7% approval rating. Um, you know, and, and even right now, the uh, Bolorte regime, Dina Bolorte herself constantly says that it's a minuscule uh, number amount of uh, people that want uh, me to step down when it's about 79% of the population, which is a very difficult to get 79% of Peruvians which include the more like liberal fascist, you know, limeños that are very much more about what their Western class interests um, than, than the, you know, very much unified Southern or, or outer regions. Um, but so, so prior to the parliamentary coup, uh, I believe Castillo had uh, entered about 66. I asked a comrade before, so I want to get the exact number, but 66 um, proyectos de ley, you know? which is like uh, uh, basically like a would be entering in a change of uh, laws um, with the uh, and ends to it being like a popular plurinational constituent assembly, getting a referendum for that. Um, so 66 times it had been rejected uh, and, and not just not just the constituent assembly, but all other kinds of uh, campaign promises. He really couldn't govern the entire time he was uh, in office. Um, and and even the uh, his vacancy, the impeachment was actually and, and his lawyer did um, came out and gave uh, actually in speaking to the judge too, 
uh, broke down all the ways that uh, legally speaking, he actually still is the constitutional president because the Congress got too ahead of themselves basically and didn't follow the pro uh, proper protocol. Um, so there's even legal, um, you know, presidents that potentially, and this is also one of the main demands is the restitution, the liberty and restitution of Pedro Castillo because he is still our democratically elected president. Um, which, and then with, uh, with that, the goal ideally being is that from these mass organizations, from the different formations coming sort of a union of, and, and we, uh, there last week there was already, or two weeks ago, no, I'm sorry, last week, uh, was already formed the Tory National Con uh, Council of Tawantin Suyo, which was, um, in Quechua means Four Corners, which is the pre-Spanish colonization Incan Empire. Um, so it's all this, all the regions that are coordinating with each other, all of the forces on the ground here in Lima, but really the, you know, who the people that are clamoring for justice, where they're really coming from, they're the ones that are really taking leadership. Um, and I think, yeah, there's, uh, there's a deep understanding that it's, it's, and, and knowing that we didn't really organize and keep organizing and agitating and supporting Castillo during mm -hmm. that's, the that's presidency, what, sorry. right? Uh, yeah, that's one yeah, of the things, ahead. I mean, I, I believe that that if you ask me, one of the biggest mistakes that Castillo did was getting disconnected with the yes. masses, you know? Yeah. Uh, not yep. keep pushing people's mobilization, not keep, yeah. you know, I believe that he felt that he was okay already because he was elected yeah. president. And at that moment, he, yeah, maybe I'm missing something. No, I, I'm, I'm just talking from the things that I see from afar, from here, from Caracas. Uh, but, but that's my, you know, the, the, an important part of it, at least in our case of Chavista victories, uh, is mobilization. Exactly. I mean, it's key. It's key. I mean, yep. if, you have, if you don't have people in the streets showing strength, showing mm -hmm. support, I mean, you are uh, you are gonna have trouble, you know, uh, you know, remaining in power, or especially yeah. in countries like us that are progressive and do not submit to, you know, U.S. interests. So, so that's, right. I mean, right. I, I see that that's one of the the biggest mistake of 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 Castillo, but uh, yeah. the the lack of strategy to you know, bypass the blockade of the Congress, and because we didn't right. have we didn't have in Venezuela right. that, that 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 facility neither. I mean, Chavez didn't have uh, during uh, you know the the constitute the constituent process in Venezuela in '99 didn't have it easy also uh, with right. the Congress. So he went to the the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court was conservative, like most Supreme mm -hmm. Courts around the world, and and. And he pushed it that hard. Of course, he flirt. I mean, how do you say that in English? Coqueteo con la derecha. And that yeah, flirted with the right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. During those first years, he flirted with the right, with the center, in yep. order to get some support. Uh, yeah. And he managed it, the Supreme Court to get the recognition that the constituent process is the most basic of the rights. You know, yeah. it's the most basic thing. We didn't have referendum in our constitution. So everything was very complex. Our 1969 constitution didn't allow referenda, didn't allow constituent right. assemblies, anything. So at the end right. of the day, he forced it. Don't you see that that might be also a mistake uh, that Pedro Castillo did? Definitely, no. definitely. Yeah, he gave a lot of concessions to the to the center and right wing at also, you know, in an attempt to, you know, save his ass, basically, um, and try to just get more broader support. Um, but the right wing had been or, had already out organized him since day one, right? Um, yeah, that's think, true. That that's true. And they yeah, attack him, him. Yeah. they attack him since this, even before yeah. taking office. And, and, yeah. and I yeah. believe that exactly. in the case of Castillo, the attacks from the right were bigger than yeah. than 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 the ones that suffer uh chavez even though chavez. the right wings hated chavez since the very beginning but they try as most of the right wingers to co-op that you know to at the beginning in the first months to try to bring him to their side 
So that, right. that says also a lot. I mean, that reality of Peru's yeah. environment, Castillo's mm -hmm. environment, uh, in comparison with Chavez's environment, says a lot about the, in my opinion, about the, the, the racism that yes. is, you know, embedded in the, into the whole, you know, Peruvian crisis, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. They they never saw someone that came from, you know, his parents that were illiterate, campesinos. He, you know, grew up in from Cajamarca, teacher, rural, indigenous, rondero. They never saw him as, as anyone that could legitimately be in power. Um, probably with Chavez was, you know, he had been in the military. There was some, you know, uh, relationship to, to an institution of power, whereas Castillo was already just seen as, you know, troublemaker, teachers, uh, but union I mean, leader. But I believe right? the Peruvian elite, the, the, the Peruvian, um, the Lima oligarchy yeah. is so racist. And, I mean, yeah. uh, every right-wing person is racist. And, and our, you know, right-wingers here in Venezuela, they are very racist. But I believe that the Lima one, is among the worst. Yep. And that's why they hated the guy that much because Chavez was black, you know, yeah. with pelo malo, as they call it here, you know, with <laughs> curly hair. Same thing. Uh, Same uh, thing, uh, yeah. You know, using the terminology that they used. Uh, 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 I mean, he had everything also uh, in yeah. order to be subjected to racism. But they try here uh, another strategy that the Peruvians mm -hmm. didn't use because, in my opinion, uh, they are full of, you know, race hatred or something like that. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely race hatred. I think it's also the like deeply anti-communist society we have, especially after Sendero Luminoso. And, you know, um, I mean, when Hector Bejar, you know, mentioned, hey, maybe the CIA was behind paying Sendero to turn the war against other sectors of the left, you know, the next day he had to resign, um, which for me was definitely the first sign that like, oh, they're going to go for it, um, meaning the right yes. wing. Um, and, and I think probably the last, uh, I remember what, so when Castillo went to the OAS, which why would you do that, right? <laughs> why would you go to the OAS, which foments right wing coups as an attempt to stop a right wing coup. I, I respect I, that he went there because he has his okay. head of state and everything. But right, I really okay. like what his speech. His speech was bad, bad. Yeah. I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I but, but I watched it and I remember that I, that I dislike it a lot. Um, uh, I would just like, interrupt and say that I do remember with what ahead. he ended. Like mm. in OAS, Castillo ended his speech with long live the OAS. No, que viva la OAS. Yes. So yes, he said yes. exactly this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why? Like the OAS, <laughs> just because OAS recognized his victory after two right. months of not saying anything. So is it right. because of that? Or, I mean, he had just like Klaus said now that he had given a lot of concessions to the right wing, the extreme right, everyone. He changed like five cabinets. 69 yeah. ministers passed through his yeah. cabinet. It's a record even for Peru. So mm -hmm. I believe that just... that was that was like, I mean, that was terrible uh, in my opinion that this political, what do you call instability? Like, do you think that this yeah. political instability was also something for which uh, many people who had initially supported him or voted for him did not organize for him in the, uh, during the, 16 months that he governed and was, I mean, not allowed to govern. That's yeah, true. yeah, no. I think a lot of people now are coming out because they weren't at that point, right? Um, I think a lot of people were saying that he did, you know, uh, before the coup when it came last year and just like talking to, you know, people on the ground, neighbors or when I was in like, uh, taxis, you know, to ask, um, or even when I went to Machu Picchu um, last year, I, I, I talked to everyone you know and everyone was saying like yeah they're not letting him govern but he's also not strong he also is just like giving again right like pointing to the fact that like, he's just giving all these concessions and at some point it's gonna it's gonna backfire and I think we all we all knew where it was heading um but I didn't think we understood um 
which is now, you know, kind of a, a very hard lesson learned. Um, listen, that... listen, Cloud, Cloud, uh, and, and what about the, how the Peruvians envision a constituent assembly? I mean, how, how, how do you see that? I mean, uh, what are the, the Peruvians expecting from the constituent assembly? And asking you that because, you know, that changed from country to country and yeah and 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 maybe uh when we hear the word the the concept constitution assembly i might be thinking on something but maybe someone in chile or peru might be thinking on another different thing so what can you tell us about that i think um so that that's definitely something that people um are are organizing and, and and politically educating ourselves and working through what that actually means, because um, many people may have different um, understandings of what that means. You know, different regions have uh, specific uh, interests in mind, right? Um, the so right now, uh, one of the rivers in the Amazon is uh, there's been an oil spill, which is really there. There's actually been multiple natural. Um, well, oh no, it feels not an actual natural accident, right? But uh, yesterday or the day before, I believe there was a hurricane in Arequipa, which I think is the death toll right now is 36. Um, so as this illegitimate govern government or coup regime really is, is still in power, all these other uh, crises are happening along with the political crisis, right? Um, which is really uh, exacerbating the, the situation, I think, um, you know, that that's something that we're people are seeing on the ground is that, you know, we all have different uh, interests from different regions to, you know, but the main thing is really uh, public ownership of our resources um, and to, to use those public, that public ownership to go towards roads, infrastructure, uh, education, healthcare, all, you know, we had, uh, I think, probably the worst mortality rate of COVID in the world. Um, you know, we were, uh, I believe the other day there was a new uh, report that came out that Peru is the fourth most unequal country in the world. Um, so th this is why this is why people are in the streets still, um, that even with the brutal repression that we're facing with the infiltration tactics, the support from the U.S. military and, and private companies, right, that like likely hire out their own security to assassinate union leaders like um, our compañero from Pura the other day. Um, so we definitely, you know, we, we, I think we understand that this is a very long process, um, and which is exactly why we're, we're really, you know, um, building here, but really deep building community politically, doing political education work. We'd love to participate in, in any sort of conversation that happens about constituent assemblies in the region because I think we need to take notes. We need to learn yes. from each other's Yes, I, I was about to ask experiences. you uh, if, if you are talking about, for example, um, communal councils, commune, and organizations yeah. on the basis, is yeah. that, that's part of the discussion too? Yeah, yeah. No, people have already been organized. Uh, because that's those, the most democratic you know, association. Uh, if yes. you ask me, that you can put in a constitution. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And also, not uh, one of the mistakes that we did in Venezuela and that Chavez tried to correct was even so, even, even though we in the constitution, in the new constitution that was wrote by Chavismo, we added new forms of ownership. You know, mm -hmm. reducing the the primacy, I don't know, la, la, la supremacía de la propiedad privada, uh, reducing uh -huh. the, 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 the primacy of private property and, and sharing right. uh, into different other ways of property that are absolutely legitimate. Uh, we we did not do that enough. So that, that if, if that's something that... that you know, because there's public yeah. common, uh, pu public property, there's communal property. Those other forms of properties are really, I believe that yeah. is, and if you are talking about constituent assemblies, uh, 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 should be part of the discussion, you know? Because, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. We, 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 in Venezuela, we did not do enough 
with that. And Chavez tried to correct mm -hmm. it, but he did not succeed. Uh, and and anyway, I just want to share those things with you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, That's yes, so be, valuable. Yes, yes, just before, just before the we do the, organize this event. And listen, I was thinking that maybe also the Black Alliance for Peace, that is an organization that I admire yes. because of the work that you that you do is very important. You can join yeah. us if you want. You, uh, I mean, yeah. you feel tempted. If you like the idea, just share it with your compass in, in, in Black Alliance for, for Peace. And Absolutely. if you want to join forces with us, we can try to do this like a joint event with different or yeah. organizations. That'd be lovely. I will try to ring Herna, Hernan Escarra, which is one of the best uh, constitutional lawyers that we have in Venezuela. Amazing. To this, I've been trying to reach him. It's not easy, uh, but I keep I, I'm I'm keep doing it in order to see if he's uh, he's gonna be available to do it. Uh, That's amazing. So, Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. Do you want to add something about the Constituent Assembly thing or about the Castillo's mistakes, Clau or Sage? Um, I mean, I, I think as far as um, what I had already, you know, had, had written down, I think that, that um, I can remember, but please go, go ahead, Saho, if you have any. Okay, so I would like to just ask a question and this also, like I've also been thinking about the Constituent Assembly or rather the Constitutional Commission or whatever it was in Chile being co-opted by the right wing. So if yeah. Peruvians can reach a place where they can call for a referendum on a Constituent Assembly like Chileans have been able to do, and then when a Constituent Assembly is installed, uh, well, similar sort of question, like is there any risk of it being co-opted by the oligarchy, the right, or even like the social democrats who are all right wingers, and how what can the people of Peru do, in your opinion, to avoid this sort of risk, like that, that's the sort of thing that happened in Chile? Yeah, I mean, we see that even happening right now. Um, you know, there. So now, some of the Congress members, the more like liberal Congress members, are putting up for. Um, uh, early elections, the constituent assembly, but of course the right wing is, is just uh, voting it down um, and, and nowhere. So Dina Belorza herself is presenting some, some of these um, proposals and um, not that I actually think that she wants to step down because in all of these uh, late laws that she's or uh, proposals she's calling for, she could actually just say, I'm stepping down and then that closes Congress. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's like an emergency, like interim government, all these things, um, that would start the process. Right. Um, but of course she's not calling for any of that. So I think that we even see it right now that the liberal, some right-wing forces are trying to co-opt this, you know, like, okay, we'll call for new elections and we'll call for a constituent assembly. And it's going to be the same parties, um, that are, you know, putting forward proposals that is already going to say, okay, we've heard what you want us, you know what you said, we'll, we'll like run our campaign for that. And then when they actually win, they can just turn around and like do what they were doing before and, and actually say, well, we won constitutionally. Um, we, we won fair elections. You know, there were, uh, um, you know, early you know elections that you guys you know called for. Uh, an important thing to avoid that is very simple and it has to deal with the if you ma finally manage to to push uh, the government and the congress to to put a question in the in the in in the ballot during the upcoming elections for example is how that question is written mm -hmm. i mean the question that will be in the ballot is the most important piece that is going to move the rest of the, you know, engranajes, we say in Spanish. <laughs> uh, yeah, so agreed. anyway, that reminds me, uh, I mean, I mean, I just remember uh, that that was part of the discussion here in Venezuela. And I just connected, I'm just connecting it what, with what's happening in, in Chile. And I'm just sharing it yeah. with you because uh, uh, I just don't want you know, repetition of mistakes uh, to happen. Yeah. But I know that it's not easy because you are dealing 
with a complex environment in, I mean, where, where your only strength is your mobilization, is the uprising yeah. itself. So, so yeah. and, and you are fighting against the, the entities, the institutions that are, yeah. are going to decide at the end of the day what is going to be there or not. But yeah. you need to 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 pay attention to to that part of the equation. I mean, the question itself, because that's key. That's key to whatever yeah, happened afterwards. You know. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree. Anyway, Thank I, you. I, yeah. I, I, I want to read a question that Judy, the friend that I mentioned you from Judy one of, of one. Um, he is a YouTuber, very good friend of us that lives in Belgium. He he asked us this question: What has been the coverage of Univision Telemundo for what has been happening in in Peru? Are most that's one question, and the other one is: Are most of the U.S. Latino people recognizing this as a U.S. Western imperialist attempt? Um, so feel free. I believe that yeah. we somehow answered that. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to read his question. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I so I'm in, I've been in Lima since January, and I even when I'm there, I don't I don't watch when he's here because it's why uh, Jorge Ramos. Is, I mean Maduro said it right. He's, Jorge, you're not a journalist. <laughs> Stop playing. Uh, which is true. So I don't watch that. But the Limeño press has been so. I thought the propaganda in the U.S. was bad, but wow, uh, propaganda here is to a whole other level and I had not experienced in my adult, adult life. Um, so I can tell you the press here is very much bought out by the oligarchy, the hard right. I mean, it's owned by some of the the, the main, uh, I believe it was the Comercio and I forget the other one that are um, owned by some of the wealthiest families in Peru that own the like Banco Nacional, that own the main banks here. So, you know, they, the oligarchy also runs and owns the media um, here. Well, not so many countries in the world, but definitely here. And you can see the really fierce campaign to malign protesters here constantly. Um, they still say that the um, compañero from Mancabelica that was, that was murdered last Saturday, uh, that he was killed by a, a rock that was thrown by you know fellow protester when when there's footage from the nearby I, I believe it was the school of music that was also named Victor uh, um, and um, yeah so it, they, they show it's the cl cameras clearly show that it was you know armed forces firing from very close directly in his uh, in his head um, and he had already been targeted like I said he's social. Uh, a union leader from Macabelica, which has been one of the regions that has been coming out and, and really been some of the frontline warriors here, um, which is why so many of the injured are coming from that region. Um, so yeah, I think that um, the, the press here, and I'm sure in the US is, you know, uh, even though I think the New York Times did come out with, with has come out with some uh, articles, they still are saying that this is a, you know, after the failed att uh, coup attempt by President Castillo, right? Um, so they're still framing this as like um, this, this this whole uprising is actually Castillo's fault, um, and and yes. the coup was actually on his on, from his end, right? So I I wouldn't be surprised if the U.S. media is also uh, U.S. Spanish media is also repeating these same lies. I believe um, that I believe and, that 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 Yuri asked the question just because of that, you know, because he knows that. Yeah, that they don't. They don't. He he wanted to hear what you are saying. You know about how yeah how you know mainstream media uh, only responds to interests of the right. Uh, and now jumping to the other part of his uh, question is how I'll, I'll just uh, interrupt and say that the, the other the other newspaper like the other big newspaper is a Republica, which does not really care about the republic. Right. Which really really? Doesn't, no. Like. 80% of the market share of all media is owned by uh, El Comercio and the rest, like nearly like 19, 18, 19% is owned by the Republica and only a very little share, at least on the national channels, like TV channels, radio channels, is um, like um, alternative media. 
So it is, I mean, Peru is a country that also needs a law of media, which will um, distribute it evenly, or let's say like equitatively. And um, there is uh, another thing I wanted to mention about this is that the, during the Fujimori era, I read that Montesinos had uh, bribed uh, most like almost all radio stations except one yeah. which was which was by like Ricardo Belmont except the Ricardo Belmont's channel who was a um, former mayor of uh, Lima I think so that mm -hmm. is that is the sort of situation like it, Montesinos had bribed so that they would always say good things about the dictatorship I think the similar sort of thing is happening I mean going on in Peru for it and like you said Despite this being like the period of democracy, the dictatorship has more or less continued de facto. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I just wanna I just wanted to jump to the other part of this question, which is which is uh, if you know people in Peru recognize this as a U.S. imperialist coup d'état, or they don't have that that. No, that, that, was, that was the first analysis. No, 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 no. I, I, I was telling my comrades in, in New York or in the U.S., right? Like, right away I land and everyone's like, the U.S. Empire is behind this. I know that Laurie Richard Tate said this. Lisa Kenna met with this person, met with this person. Like, the political education on the ground is very much, like, I was very, like, oh, damn, okay, cool. <laughs> this that's is great. Nice. I don't have to convince, I don't have to convince to anyone. Great. <laughs> yeah, no, that's people, people are very much aware. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good to know that uh, from Venezuela we see it that way, but of course you always have the right wingers or the liberals that just think uh, that the, that Mickey Mouse exists and and yeah. that everyone yeah. is good uh, if they play the the tune that they like. Mm -hmm. But uh, the mm -hmm. people on the ground, at least here in Venezuela, they know that that this is something that cannot happen if the U.S. don't allow it to happen. Basically, absolutely. Uh, absolutely so, so this is the last question from the from the from youtube have there uh, have there been have there been any updates on pedro castillo well-being is he doing okay is he's he okay he yeah he's 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 doing well uh well i don't know if he's doing well but he is okay um still you know uh i i think maybe last week or the week before no, no, it was after the death of um, our comrade from Moncabalica um, that he came out with a, a letter just, you know, still blaming Dina Boluarte and, and, and Congress for every, you know, death that has occurred. And um, basically just saying, like, to my people, stay out in the street, keep mobilizing, like, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I think he's, he's, he's as best as probably, probably can be. Um, but many people are definitely worried, um, you know, if, if he's going to make it out, um, you know, but, but that's 100 percent. That's one of the main demands is uh, freedom and restitution of our uh, the, the, democratically the, the, elected The judicial president. process, the timing, do you have any insights about that? When is he going to? So they gave him 18 months uh, preliminary detention. They actually, and, and one of my comrades was included in this, uh, were trying to give some of the protesters that were arrested this Saturday nine months preliminary detention. Um, so this this past weekend um, was, I think, in Lima, the largest amount of detainees in one night. I think it was something around uh, 127, probably, honestly, probably more. The numbers are always, you know, low. Um, but they were, this, it seems that this week the operative, the operation was just to detain as many people as possible and plant evidence. Um, so there's videos of multiple protesters that have been, um, detained where you could see, and what I was saying before, the infiltrators sneaking something like a rock or, or really anything that they could say like, oh, this person is going to be a terrorist, you know? Um, so they're definitely planting evidence. I myself had had my uh, bag checked and and I was with a couple other people. You know, I'm just, I'm independent press, I'm independent press, um, that they don't care. They're, you know, definitely trying to uh, plant evidence, but there was enough people around us that they eventually left. Um, so that's good too on the ground is you really see the immediate on the ground solidarity you also see the immediate, like, hey, this person is an infiltrator, and, and people are quick with it. They, 
they expel that person right away, um, you know, and, and it's, we also know not to, you know, uh, sometimes you got to back away and not everything needs to be recorded. Listen, and, and I've seen your, your Instagram feed lately and, and, and in the last 48 hours, things has been very uh, moving a lot in, in Lima, according to what you have posted. Uh, is that the reality? I mean, I mean, my question is, hmm, do you feel that finally the uprising is reached in Lima and it's going to remain there to stay? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the mommies that was um, arrested this past weekend and, and she was finally uh, released yesterday. Um, I think she's a... 52 year old woman from uh, Ayacucho, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and Antina, and this woman wearing the pollera uh, with Peruvian colors, red and white, who since the beginning has been in front, waving her flag, just telling these people that they're, uh, the, the, you know, as we say, tombos here, uh, police pigs, um, telling them their truth just constantly, constantly. And then uh, this past weekend she was arrested and, and detained for 48 hours. Yesterday she was released. Um, she gave a really beautiful and passionate speech that, you know, um, basically at the end, she was saying, I don't know why they're going to keep, why they keep insisting that, that we are a minuscule number or, or that these are, we're terrorists or that we're paid by, um, you know, outside interests. But um, she said, I, one thing's for sure, I know myself and my people, we're going to stay here until we win. It's, it's not even an option that we don't win. Um, that's, that's, you know, that, that is absolutely the, the sentiment on the ground, um, that we knew that this was going to be a long battle. We knew this was going to be a hard battle. We don't, you know, I think some people, especially the Jimenos are, are scared, especially with all the infiltration tactics that have been happening, that, um, you know, a lot of really intense things have, have been happening. I, it really does seem like every single brigade, every single organization has been infiltrated. And people are really shook, you know. Uh, psychological terror is one of the one of the tactics that this dictatorship is employing. Um, but I think this the steadfastness of our people is is there. That's nice. That's nice. I believe that we have reached our time. We are almost ready to go. And I thank you a lot, Cloud, for giving thank us. Thank you. The time, your time, because I know that things are moving fast there. I want you to be safe out there. Also, I know how those things are from our own experience here in Venezuela. And, and always, whenever you are outside, look for a escape way, you know, or a cover. I whenever will. you are in those kinds of demonstration, you have to take in mind two things. One, looking for a escape way whenever yeah. whatever whenever place you are in and the other one look for a cover in the case they are shooters because they can yeah. be shooters yeah. at some point that want to create more bloodshed and accuse the left of you know at least that's what i say from our experience here in venezuela yeah so yeah. so try to be safe there uh, uh, thank you. And thank you again for your time. I don't know if, if you want to say something, but after, uh, if you want to say something, we will jump afterwards to Sahi to make some final uh, closing statements. Or maybe Mateo want to say something. Mateo has been helping us in the background, uh, you know, taking notes and, and interacting with the people in YouTube. So go ahead, Cloud. Uh, nothing, just, you know, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to, you know, this is a, a start of a long conversation, I think, because um, I really, I think it's so important to share notes um, on all of our different processes um, throughout the region. And, and yeah, just follow my, uh, follow our work at Black Alliance for Peace, um, all of our social media. I think next week um, I'll start, uh, also having weekly updates um, on the ground at Black Agenda. Tell us your Report. social media accounts info. Yeah, um, so on Twitter, I'm at, uh, at Violin's Ghost. Um, and on Instagram, um, at, at Michi Sachipapas. Um, both of these are just 
names of different animals I've had in my life. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can find me there. Uh, Block Lines for Peace is always re uh, sharing my stuff. So you can just follow us there as well. And we are always, we always have uh, statements coming out. Not just in Peru, but we were talking before the CELAC, apparent support for the Haitian, uh, you know, trampling of Haitian sovereignty once again. Um, so we do a lot of really good work, um, and and also uh, as I was saying, I'll be starting I think next week, um, publishing a Black Agenda report. Thank you, folks. Okay, so thanks a lot, Cloud, for accepting this uh, invitation and uh, clarifying a lot of things that we did not know or knew only sketchily. Uh, and I know we can be here like all day, 24 hours. But anyway, uh, I, I mean, there have been some comments in the YouTube chat. Oh, I'm sorry that we have not been able to address everyone because, and like I said, otherwise we'll be here 24 hours. So somebody uh, commented that Peru just like well, Peru is a uh, narco state. And I have heard this from a lot of people, including from Hector Veja, whom you mentioned, that Peru is the second largest producer of cocaine in the world, just followed, following Colombia. And nobody talks about it. So, and somebody mm -hmm. else, like Christian Peña from uh, Canada, was saying that um, uh, Pedro Castillo was going to uh, nationalize copper industries. Uh, I, I don't think he was going to yeah. nationalize exactly, but he said that he was not going to renew certain contracts. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So actually, a lot of the, the the timeline for all of this just so happens to coincide with the renewal of a lot of the contracts that are due to expire this year, uh, later this year. So that's why the coup had to happen when it happened, um, because Castillo was maybe not, like you said, not entirely nationalize everything, but certainly keep a good portion of it uh, state under state hands that would then, you know, supplement healthcare, uh, education, infrastructure, what have you. Um, and in terms about the, you know, Peru being a, a narco uh, state, I mean, yeah, the, we are the second largest producer of cocaine, but I would ask the DEA and the CIA why they're still here, right? Um, I think those are the forces behind what produces narco terrorism in our, in our country. Well, in all countries of Latin America, like DEA, CIA, exactly. uh, real narco traffickers of the world. So they right, to get exactly. Organized crime, as we say. Yeah. Yep. So thanks a lot for clarifying these two questions also, because otherwise, I, I guess people would have been a bit disappointed that we did not address everything. But I guess we have addressed almost everything that have been on YouTube as well as that have been in our head. So finally, I'd like to ask, like, invite um, the audience to follow um, Clau on her social media. She just mentioned the um, account names and also follow Black Alliance for Peace, whom we also follow and like uh, for all the, the two. Please also follow Orinoco Tribune um, and also on our social media. In, you, we, we are everywhere, starting from uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Telegram, Instagram, uh, Reddit. Uh, we also have a Discord server, and all these links are in the website, wow. orinocotribune.com. So please join. And we are all, always hard stepped for cash. So please also give some donations if you like our work. Also donate to Black Alliance for Peace and the organizations that Clau mentioned so that uh, the, the help reaches Peruvian people directly. So thanks a lot for being a very engaging audience, for all your questions, for comments. Thanks a lot to our friend Yuri, to uh, Dialectics Unhinged, people I know personally, as well as uh, Red Horizon, Christian Peña, Ricky. Um, well, I guess I am missing a lot of people. Julie, well, many people were there. So thanks a lot to all of you. Now, our next event is very close. It is a special interview on 10th of February at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. It will be with the um, chairperson of the African People's Socialist Party, Umali Eshitela, hey. and, and Joe Isobekar from Freedom Road Socialist Organization will be like discussing the FBI repression against these organizations. 
and like they will be here they will talk about it so hope to see you like all of you and cloud also in that uh, interview it's so gonna be that's gonna be a pre-recorded one but we will uh but okay. we will uh Publish it. it and just upload it to YouTube and, and we are going to make a, a piece about the interview that we're going to publish on Orinoco Tribune. So we hope that you enjoy us because we want to highlight this recent aggression against the Uhulu, you know, organization in, in, in the U.S. Yeah. and connected with uh, the, the one that happened in 2010 against in the Midwest against organizations like Freedom Road Socialist Organizations and other progressive organizations uh, and mm -hmm. Palestinian organizations in the region. Yeah. So they, that's basically part of an intimidation strategy that is very common in the U.S. to try to destroy anything that is progressive and, and that uh, connects to international solidarity. Uh, yeah. and, and that's something that needs to be fight. Uh, because uh, international solidarity is one of the key elements of, you know, being a, a socialist-minded, a, a Marxist, Leninist, and, and and we need to defend it at all costs. So we are going to talk about that. Thank you again all for your help, you. Compass. I, we invite you to help us with donations because we always need that, but also to help Cloud that is on the ground and needs also some help. And thank you again. Un abrazote from Caracas. Bye bye. Un abrazo from Lima. Ciao. Bye bye. I'm going to end.